Yeah, making the new IP is, uh, how can I put it? It's just, uh, just don't do it. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's insane. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult process. You have more questions than you have answers, especially when you come from like, uh, you've been making Uncharted 1 and Uncharted 2, just kind of like, now like things are going, you just kind of like, uh, like good momentum. And then suddenly that momentum like just drops, it stops. It's a very challenging process to create a new IP and you're gonna fail over and over again. But that's what it takes. New IPs are really hard. They're hard because you don't know what's fun yet. You're building new tech, new AI, establishing new characters, new art, all this. You don't get to get that controller in your hand for like six months to a year. You don't know. You don't know what it is yet. I remember like ages ago coming on the project and what are the, what are the infected going to do? Like what are they going to do? They're going to behave like this. And I'm like, okay. And we're like trying to imagine what's going to happen. Fast forward like four months, they don't do that at all because no. it didn't work, right? It's hard mode, right? Like it's game <laughs> development on, <laughs> art, on expert. There's a big thing about making a game, right? Which is a game has to be fun. You get your first build where everything's working. You got player mechanics. You can run, walk around the world. You can shoot. You can melee attack people. You've got the AI in there. They're very intelligent, very difficult. And it's totally not fun because they snuck up behind you and murdered you in a second and there was no way to figure out what was going on. We're making a game, by the way. Hey, James. quite a bit since, um, since I started. I think I was the 12th employee or something back uh, when we got started, but we've tried to stay true to those smaller studio roots. I've been here for 16, going 16 years. There's just no reason to leave. I just I just like the environment here. It's very non-corporate. I think the way we work in Nyog is kind of special because we don't really like hierarchy or bureaucracy and no one is really just just a manager here. Naughty Dog has a very flat structure. Uh, we pretty much all report to the co-presidents uh, and the game directors. I always tell people when we hire them, just like, my job is going to uh, be able to trust you. And that's what I want. I want just to give you something and you just you go with it and I know it's going to get done. We believe in iteration, we believe in collaboration, and we believe in uh, the people making the game working directly with each other. When we have uh, designers and artists, animators all mixed up, anybody that's working on the same tasks, the same characters, the same areas, put them next to each other so they can communicate a lot better. We don't have a lot of meetings because if you need something to get done, you just walk over and you talk and then you go back to your desk and you finish it up. And I really like that. I like when just I just walk in the office and I see just a designer talking with the programmers or programmers uh, over the uh, the animators and talking to them. I think that's when really the uh, magic uh, happens. Naughty Dog, we really try to cultivate a culture where anybody can criticize anybody else's work. Can we encourage people to um, to be blunt about it and not try to sugarcoat it too much? Um, it takes uh, too long to, to be nice sometimes. <laughs> it is, it's not personal. It's based on more like how can we make a bear game. Well, we want everybody to have a voice. We want to cut out all the bullshit if we can, making sure that people are making decisions not based on ego, but what is going to benefit the game. When you see that people trust your opinion and that they value it, it's like, it's such a great feeling. You, you really feel like you're working as a team on a collaborative effort. We want to uh, sort of remember where we came from and, and you know why we were successful then and, and try to continue that success now. We make games. That's what we like to do. Back when Uncharted 2 wrapped up and we decided that we were going to uh, build the second team and, and create a, a new project, we kicked around a lot of ideas. Um, one of the very earliest ideas was to go back to Jack and Daxter. 
it's really near and dear to us. We really love those characters in that universe, and we think that you know, there are some interesting stories still to be told there. We started to realize that it was not going to do justice to the the franchise that the, the fans had fallen in love with. It would be shifting it so far in a new direction that um, we felt that that effort would uh, be more justified in, in developing a new IP. Neil and, and Bruce came to Kristoff and I and, and said they wanted to do a, a post-apocalyptic game. I think the the, the core essence of what they wanted to do, though, was to try to tell a story uh, about two people and uh, how their relationship evolves over the course of the entire game. That potential, oh wow, there is something very spe special about that game. That it, this is going to be polished, like you're not sure if it's going to work or not, and you have doubts, and like, should we be doing a game like that? Should we be doing a first-person shooter? Whatever, like, you, you, you ask yourselves all those questions. And, you know, the creative director and the game director are the, the, the core of the team that have to really see eye to eye. That's why you have that balance between like Bruce and Neil and Neil's gonna try to push the uh, just the story and the characters and 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 Bruce is going to try to push that with just the gameplay as well and so it's kind of like they're those guys are just trying always to find to find the right balance be between the two it's a it's a very uh, delicate process we feel that the interactive medium has an untapped potential to touch the feelings of, of, of the player. You have that connectivity, the fact that I'm actually in the world and participating in what's happening on the screen in front of me it gives us some sort of advantage to make you feel connected with what's actually happening. At Naughty Dog, that's what we're trying to do is pair story and gameplay together. If we can make you feel like you're actually with these characters on that journey, and you're invested in those stories and those characters, then you're feeling, the, in theory, the same thing that they're feeling. As the story evolved and took different shapes and different forms, the thing that was always there was Joel and Ellie. And because of that, everything kind of uh, grew out of that relationship. We've seen kind of that role of the anti-hero change especially over the last three to five years, to where before it was like, you know, the thick neck mercenary kind of guy. For this game specifically, for this story, we needed something new. The reason we didn't want to make Ellie Joel's daughter from the get-go is because it wouldn't have anywhere to go. Of course, at that point, he'd be willing to do anything for his daughter because that is what a dad would do for his daughter. If they didn't even know each other at the beginning of the story, then we start from scratch, and it's almost like the player has the same relationship to Ellie as Joel does. And we could take our time to build that relationship between these characters, and if we do it right, then the player will be feeling that same growth that Joel does, and we're kind of mirroring that, that emotional relationship between the two. What are you doing? Killing time. Well, what am I supposed to do? I am sure you will figure that out. Your watch is broken. It's exciting that Neil wrote something like this, where he's like, I don't want to make the stereotypical characters. I want to make real people in this crazy situation and these th forced to make decisions that are really tough. Like, what would we be like in those situations? I mean, we weren't consciously trying to pick male or female for characters. You just try to pick characters and just be honest with who they are. It almost doesn't matter, right? Joel's daughter could have been Joel's son. Ellie could have been a boy and Joel might have been Tess. You could have swapped those roles and I think the story would have still worked. The focus on female strength, it's so unique. You get to see what's so powerful about a woman through all of these female characters, which makes this game wonderful and unique. There's a crew of fireflies that'll meet you at the Capitol building. <laughs> That's not exactly close. You're capable. You hand her off, come back, the weapons are yours. Double what Robert sold me. Speaking of which, where are they? Back in our camp. <laughs> We're not smuggling shit until I see them. I want Joel to watch over her. Whoa, whoa, I don't Bullshit, think that's the I'm best not him. How do you know them? 
I do think having a strong female character, especially like Ellie, is so rare in video games. And as a gamer, and more specifically a female gamer, it's frustrating to me because I'll, I'll see sort of the, the stereotypical female character where she's amazingly beautiful and huge boobs and she's there to be either the love interest or just because they're like, well, we need to throw a chick in here. We've seen the strong woman or we've seen the weak woman. We haven't necessarily seen the empowered woman from this kind of standpoint. And there's a, that beautiful scene where Joel finds her inside the house and she's reading through this girl's journal going, is this really what they used to worry about? What, what shirt do I wear and what boy am I going to go out with? You know, and to be met with those first world problems that we deal with every day and go, how trivial is all of this? I think it's going to resonate a lot, not just with you know, a female audience, but with a male audience as well. The thing that was intriguing to me after the fact is knowing that we're kind of creating a female action hero in a way, and this is her origin story with Ellie. To sort of be such a strong female character that is completely normal looking, regular t-shirt and jeans, and she's 14 and she is still a total badass, is really exciting to be a part of that. With so few non-sexualized women in video games, uh, especially in the main role, that we were kind of proud that we were creating one. It's very complex, and without the players knowing it, she becomes the protagonist by the end of the story. And that's why she's in the front of the box, and that's why we've been promoting the two of them together so much. Who's there? It is a dual protagonist game, and um, yeah, I guess I, I get nervous to think about it in that way. <laughs> Uh, we couldn't talk about it. In fact, in interviews, we've been lying about it, saying you never play as Ellie because it was so important for that to be a surprise. Sorry, journalists. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. That's it. The tone of the game was set pretty early on that we knew that we wanted to make a really grounded story. We knew that we wanted to make the player feel the sense of tension and dread and go through the same emotional roller coaster that Joel and Ellie were going through. One of the things we kind of struggled with is to say, well, if we want to really ground this world and make it so like realistic, maybe we shouldn't have anything that could be perceived as a monster. Maybe like by just having an infection that just killed people and it's all about humans and how they deal with this uh, post-apocalyptic society and how different people decide to survive, maybe that would be enough. And what we realize is because we're making an action game, a lot of the storytelling happens on the joystick. And once we remove the infected, it's like all of a sudden now we can't tell the story through gameplay of what happened to the world. Uh, and that's where we kind of went back and kind of brought the infected back in because it lets you see, once you're fighting them, the threat that people had to deal with that otherwise would just be very cerebral and people could talk about it, but you couldn't necessarily experience it yourself. In a novel, that might work. In a game for us, in a specifically an action game, it didn't work. And from there, when we start kicking around those ideas, and we're just like, what would be cool just to play? The early inception for it really came from a BBC video we saw called Planet Earth, where they were talking about a cordyceps fungus. This Cordyceps fungus gets inside of the brain and controls these ants and mandibles start chomping, they grow up to higher areas, cordyceps fungus sprouts out and then it germinates. And essentially uh, uses them to spread the, its infection, and take over whole colonies, sometimes wiping them out. As soon as we saw it, we were intrigued by the idea of what if it jumped to humans? So what would happen? How would people react? What would happen to society? As we're trying to develop the look of the infected, um, we went through so many different iterations, some that looked really alien and subhuman, um, some that looked just essentially like zombies, uh, and we couldn't find like an original place for them. But one of our artists uh, just did this kind of photo mashup where he took a bunch of images of diseases or images of fungal overgrowth, uh, and he kind of mashed it all together and he threw it on this person. It was a very iterative process, making sure that the fungus felt properly integrated, like it was part of the body, growing out of the body. And not just fungus growing in the head, but it's tearing the face apart, cleft down the middle, this 
gaping maw of a mouth with the crooked teeth. And it's in great agony as its humanity and its brain is still somewhat functioning. Maybe you still have some hu human cognitive abilities or, or thought process back here. This isn't some decaying corpse on the ground. This is a living thing that's going to be coming after you in the world. The fungus is always the focal point. So you can see from a distance, oh, this guy's infected. I can tell straight away. And fungus, they have these beautiful saturated colors. And we really like that conscious of this something so horrific that it's going to like stop at nothing it's relentless force of death and yet it, elements of it are beautiful it's not just about gore it's not just about everything about it being scary because to us it's actually scarier when things on it are some, somewhat benign or somewhat beautiful. Uh, it was evident that we were onto something that was quite a bit different and something that we hadn't really seen before which was eerily human but very disturbing. And it seems so creepy and so unique that right away we're gravitated towards it and it's like, this is our base infected, everything should kind of come out of this look. So once we had this idea of the face splitting kind of look that eventually became what we called the clicker stage. We went to great lengths to create a full biological cycle for these things. So in the early stages you don't actually see too many signs of uh, the fungus surfacing out of the skin. It's kind of underneath it, like people have lumps starting to show. The eyes will be kind of cloudy um, or lopsided because the fungus kind of originates inside the head. That moves into the next phase, which is the clicking phase. And if they mess with the eyes, we end up saying, well, how do they get around? Oh, echolocation. And they use a form of echolocation to track down their enemies. Uh, just like bats or even some blind people can see by making a clicking sound, a sound that on its own wouldn't be very scary. And then to associate it with something that people in this world are very fearful of, so that as you're exploring an environment, all of a sudden you hear this click and you're seeing everybody just get frightened, just everybody duck, everybody hushes. The bloater is the most severe of the stages. So large pieces of the body has been replaced by these kind of fungal plates. The, the fungus completely takes over the body and blooms. They're kind of covered in things that have been growing on them. Things like moss and like life on life kind of. When infected, it feels like it's going to die, it finds like a dark corner and it becomes part of the environment. The human elements aren't there anymore. And then the body is gone. They lay down and sprout and then spew spores. And if people can breathe those spores, they become infected as well. It all had to kind of make sense of how each stage flowed from one to the other. And that's hopefully how we've created a world that you can kind of look through it and understand the science behind it and say, I could buy this, I could get into this. Mandatory evacuation. Evacuate to where? Rethink. Quarantine zone. See, some places got a heads up before the infection showed up. Most didn't. Uh, over the course of Joel and Ellie's journey through this game across America, you find all these different societies, all these different enclaves, and you get to see how do they deal with the infected. Without the manifestation of this infection, you can't have these people making those interesting choices. The world we decided was actually its own character, really grounded with a lot of texture. What happens, you know, after 20 years of the fall of man, when no one's taking care of anything? Uh, this book called uh, The World Without Us describes in detail how much fighting on a day-to-day -day basis we have to do to keep nature back. And once you stop doing that, how quickly nature can reclaim that. As they talk about New York and how every day they pump water out of the subway system. That system breaks down, within two days a whole city is flooded. And once water gets introduced, then structures collapse pretty quickly. Trees will sprout and wind will carry those seeds over and gutters get clogged and then when it rains, water fills up and then pretty soon you have vegetation going over there and once you have vegetation, Concrete breaks pretty easily for when there's a tree and roots breaking through that. 
Even some of the stuff we did on Uncharted, you know, exploration of how temples were ruined. What if you took those ideas and put them in Pittsburgh or Boston? And obviously right when that happened, you can imagine that being pretty terrible to look at. But you think about 20 years later, and with rainwater filling up those sinkholes, and then those becoming like little marshes with lily pads in them. We had this wonderful piece of concept art we developed really early on, and there are all of these wild animals that have escaped from a zoo, and over the past 20 years have bred, and now they have herds roaming these cities. And that's something that tells you that life goes on, and this world is worth saving. something really pretty about nature reclaiming its domain once we are gone. So fucking cool. We have another level of OCD of the logic goes into some of these environments. Water damage seeps into them, that creates some little moss growing on the floor, or a tree radiates energy from its base, and that over time starts to melt the snow around it. And that's the reason why you'd see those little rings of leaves showing through in the snow. That gives it that extra, you know, believability. This is pitch art. I'll try to start with an idea that, that conveys sort of the feel of the environment. Something like this, very brushstrokey, very painterly. You can see not a lot of detail, just energy and, and conveying a mood. This is sort of just a conversation starter. And then this would be more of an actual space. So you start talking about, is this too tight of a space right here? Would the player even fit through there? Do we even want to include water? Those are conversations you start having a little bit later. And then it usually needs several more passes back and forth in order to be tightened up to be the, the experience that you would see in the final product. So, dude, I was actually trying to figure out right here, there should probably be some dead foliage. It might be cool to see some of the dead stuff around the edges of the green or like even spilling out into the street. Maybe what we do is, in some of these areas, we use it as like a transition to form from the actual concrete to the side of the building. So like they're almost sitting on top of a bed of dead foliage, like that really rich kind of like orangey brown yeah. color. Sienna or something would be nice. Something real cheddar. That's how you know you're done. The end product often ends up being stronger because that bouncing back off somebody else gives you a result that maybe you wouldn't have even thought of in the first place. All right, there's the bridge. That's our way out of here. As far as concept art goes, definitely the ultimate goal is just helping everybody as much as possible. Me and the background artists will work together. I'll often just go to them because they've got like a really, really good like visual imagination. At some point, you came in almost like flat on. So that's kind of good because the bus station is right in your peripheral view and and you're probably gonna enter the bus station. You're probably not gonna get lost. But it doesn't at all utilize this cool architecture here, like the bus station sign. Like that's a really distinctive silhouette and it's a really interesting sort of architectural detail. So if we change the entrance. Look at that, another city, another abandoned quarantine zone. I think it's a better composition anyway. It's not so like symmetrical. Um, and I think that was done so that this sign read better. If you didn't see the white bus on it, you might not know it's a bus station. So I think that helps. But everything we're doing in the environment is relating back to what you should be feeling in the story or what's happening to these characters. So is that everything you hoped for? Jury's still out. But man, you can't deny that view. Come on, this way. When we first came up with Ellie and Joel, we had this idea in our heads of who they would be, but we didn't necessarily know the voice. It took us a while to find our Joel, but for Ellie, I think Ashley was the second or third candidate to walk in, and right away we knew. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Why are you so scared all of a sudden? Because, because I'm a coward, okay? So just get your shit, let's get out of here. <sighs> Damn it. Not like her, you know. What? You think I'm gonna end up like your daughter? The way she delivered the lines, the way she just embodied that character is like, that's Ellie, there's no question about it. And I saw the character artwork and I related to her a lot. I mean, she's kind of a tomboy and she's kind of tough. And I mean, obviously I'm not 14 and I think that's the main difference between the two of us. I read the scenes and I was like, I need to play this part. You want to be my hero? 
Forget the whole bit about saving my life. Buy me a stack of these bad boys instead. Where'd you get that? Back at Bill's. I mean, all of this stuff was just lying around. And then once we had her, we said, okay, well, we're going to do another round. And we're going to have Ashley this time in the casting sessions. The chemistry of these two characters was imperative to get right. Troy was a really interesting casting for Joel because when you see Troy, he doesn't look like Joel at all. You know, he's so handsome and he had like, you know, the frosty hair and totally looked like Final Fantasy. And so... <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't know. He's like this tall, pretty... Um, it didn't seem right. I walked into the room fully aware that I was the youngest person that they were seeing for this role. There was a line that was in the audition side that says that Joel has few moral lines left across. And so that became the anchor point to the character. But then as soon as he spoke and he had the grit in his voice, warm yet kind of dangerous. And his movement is just like you bought into it. Why are you so scared all of a sudden? Because I'm a big coward, okay? Now pack up your shit and let's go. God damn it. I'm not her, you know. What? You think I'm gonna end up like your daughter? Lily, you are treading on some very thin ice right now. It was Ellie and Joel. After he read, it was just like that was that was it. I've done some video games in the past, but to be handed the mantle of a franchise like this was a pretty big honor. Is she alive? She's alive. She's David's newest pet. Ah! Where? In the town. She's in the town. Ah! You mark it on the map. It better be the same exact spot your buddy points to. Neil pulled me aside one day and he said, I have some ideas. And as you're well aware, uh, Neil is a little twisted. He came up with this character and, you know, I just jumped at it. It was such a departure from everything I've done here for Naughty Dog, uh, to say the least. Name's David. This here's my friend James. We're from a larger group. Women, children. They're all very, very hungry. To be able to put on a voice that, you know, hopefully a lot of people won't know, uh, won't notice that it's even me. Because we didn't want it to be Drake. Drake eating people, that's... That's a whole nother game. How did you put it? Tiny pieces. See you tomorrow, Ellie. You know, certain voices that I can do wouldn't fit the David's artwork, and but he showed me the art, and I, I said, maybe it's something like this, where everything's, you know, it's very quiet, and just, you know, he's not really sure, and the voice can break a little. And he just looked, he goes, yeah, that's it. So it, it, I, I'd love to tell you how we hashed it over and we talked. No, it was, it, it just, I looked at the picture and I tried something. He said, yeah. A few weeks back, I sent a group of men out in a nearby town to look for food. Only a few came back. And turns out that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. And get this, he, he was with a little girl. You see, everything happens for a reason. Claire. Ashley, she brought humor to it. She just has some really great comedic timing. The way she reacts to the things around the world with a little bit of sarcasm, that teen kind of like trying to get a rise out of you. Now watch your step as you're going out, because it's going to be a little... <laughs> it just brought a certain levity to the story that the story needed. You didn't even realize it needed it until she started doing some of that stuff. Oh, I'm sure your friend will be missing this tonight. Mm -hmm. It's light on the reading, but it's got some interesting photos. Now, now Ellie, that ain't for kids. Whoa! How... How the hell would he even walk around with that thing? Get rid of that. Now, hold Just... your horses. I want to see what all the fuss is about. Oh. Why are these all stuck together? Um. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. 
Bye bye, dude. Throughout the course of shooting over these past couple of years, Ellie and I have kind of morphed into each other, which I know sounds so cheesy. Neil always asks, he's like, well, what would you do in this situation? I think the most important thing that Ashley brought is a sense of capability to Ellie's character that wasn't there in the beginning. The very first thing we shot involved her being pulled out of a car and attacked and Joel is supposed to go save her. It was written that Ellie sort of was just kind of watching on the side, just waiting till he was done. And I was a little frustrated because I was like, well, I, if this were real life, I would do something. We did a couple takes and at some point she walked up to me and she said, I feel like I'd hit him. So we added in a part, like, you know, right there off the bat, she's not just this damsel in distress. Right there, she wanted to fight back from her very first day of shooting. We didn't have it right initially. She needs to be more capable than initially we thought she would be, and actually that made us go back and rethink combat and rethink a lot of the areas in the game. And now she was going to take a much more active part. <laughs> Anything that requires, you know, a lot of body movement, we do with the actors on the mocap stage. And we try as much as possible to use our actual principal actors, use their body motion as well as their voice. We capture it all at once there on the stage. Having the actors perform as well as being recorded at the same time was imperative to get an accurate performance. Because every time you, you split up the performance in any way, you lose some of that magic where they, they did a gesture or they delivered the line a certain way. And those things have to be in sync or there's just something subconscious that's like off-putting about the performance when you don't do it that way. You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. It gives you the most authentic, most realistic performance because you're actually there, not just making your own choices, but making your own choices based on the other people that are involved in that scene. So you get this truly um, natural approach to things and it shows up. It's like theater in the round. You can do anything from any angle and the smallest, most subtle thing will be able to pick up. There's no place to hide. So you have to be as prepared as possible because you have no idea which moments they're going to use. There are these little improv moments and you know little nuances that you get that probably isn't scripted that just comes out of play. You know while they're performing that that mistake that is just blossomed into a really good idea. Did we improv on The Last of Us? Yes, yes, we did. Doing this was a whole lot like being five, playing in the backyard with a stick, you know, and this is my machine gun, and you know, and a pine cone is, is my hand grenade. It's all your imagination. I'm doing the exact same shit that I did 45 years ago. I just get paid for it now. We square. We're square. And get the fuck out of my town. I don't do a lot of voiceover work, so for me, it was nice to be able to work off of your other actors. I, I can't imagine it working any other way. I'd never done mocap before. I didn't know what to expect. The suits were crazy. Yeah, the suit gave me wedgies. <laughs> like, deep wedgies that I had to pick out with my middle finger. Too much information. <laughs> Just how damn sexy I look in a motion capture suit. I look like 10 pound of sausage in a five pound casing in that thing, man. <laughs> Once you get past the fact that like everybody else and your, you look like weird clown people with these little dots and stuff, once you like give over to that, it really was pretty easy to make it just feel like you're in the moment and in the scene. So everyone that was on this is a slam dunk. This isn't just another gig to them. And that creates a, a really cool energy for people to really start experimenting and playing jazz. Floor is yours. And action. <laughs> hey, oh, let her go. Don't worry, this is fixable. But I can't come with you. Well, then I'm staying. Ellie. I want Joel to watch over her. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, Absolutely. shit, I'm Ellie. Ellie. I could just take her to the North Tunnel and wait for me there. Jesus Christ. Just cargo, Joel. 
How do you know them? You know, we craft the scene out uh, until it has a good feel, and then we pass it off to animation to clean it up. Real life motions don't necessarily always translate into gameplay. There's something that's usually missing, so we have to, you know, maybe enhance the gesture or enhance the shoulder movements or a, a breath that you want to be able to feel, but you don't really see it, so you can't really feel it unless you see it. Is everything all right? Yeah, everything's fine. I could have him lean in here a little bit more, like this, take his hand down. When they're on stage, they don't necessarily have windows, you know, so that weight of like really pushing and leaning in, that's something that we would have to 